Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the What Is Money Show. Sitting down again today with Mr. John Bervaki. Um, I guess you're almost a famous lecturer now on YouTube with the Awakening from the <laughs> Meaning Crisis series, which has been very impactful for myself, um, and I think just very relevant to the times we're in. So. We've been exploring a lot of these connections between uh, John's world of cognitive science and you know our studies of socioeconomics. And today we're going to jump into this concept of mythology. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think in the Western world today, there's this kind of slang phrase where, oh, that's a myth. That means yes. it's fake. Yeah. It means yeah. it's untrue. Yes. Um, but I think that's very deeply, a deeply flawed conception of, of myth. And I'll, I'll open with one thing here. So I, I think this is from Joseph Campbell. And I'll paraphrase a little bit. He said that the job of the artist is to mythologize the present for future generations. Hmm. That sounds like Joseph Campbell. Yeah. Very much. Um, yeah, I mean, it was Joseph Campbell's interview with Bill Moyers, The Power of Myth, that really uh, brought yeah. Yeah. myth into uh, into my, I guess call it my academic theoretical consideration. I mean, I'd already been uh, interested in Jung's work, uh, both uh, theoretically and personally. I went through Jungian therapy. I did Jungian workshops. I really wanted to understand it. Uh, I also needed it. Uh, um, <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but I also, uh, you know, uh, the Bill Moyers power myth and Joseph Campbell. Yeah. So, which is, which is on, uh, I think it's six part documentary series on Netflix. It used to be on yeah. Netflix at least it was transformational for me too. I've watched it three yeah. times. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's very powerful. Um, and there, there's, if you read it in the right way, the comparison between Jordan Peterson and Joseph Campbell are there's 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 important similarities there. Yeah, uh, they, they, uh, there's differences too. I mean, sure. uh, Jordan sure. is also a, you know a bona fide psychologist and researcher in his mm -hmm. own right, but uh, the sense in which uh, making the Jungian approach to myth um, accessible to a generation, uh, they were both doing that in certain mm -hmm. ways. Yes. Uh, Campbell had a more Sort of religious studies background and jordan has a more cognitive psychology my background is is, uh, is cognitive science philosophical historical um and i think i think the way to connect art to mythology the way campbell intends we need to talk about three related things um and we need to talk about them carefully and deeply uh and see why the common usage of the word myth is misplaced i often use the word mythos because I've given up trying to get people to understand the word myth. Mm. Um, and that's the Greek word. And you can see the contrast within Plato between logos, logos or logos uh, and mythos. So I'll, I'll keep saying mythos because I want to, you know, it's close enough to myth that people know what I'm gesturing at, but it's mm. different enough that they'll be open to what, well, maybe there's something, a new, mm. you know, a new phenomenon that needs to be investigated. So the three terms I want to talk about are, um, metaphor, symbol, and the imaginal, and why these are really, really important to our understanding of myth. I would say that my the view I'm going to um, argue for, or, or at least propose, is a view that integrates, it's a post-Jungian view, integrating ideas from Jung, uh, Corbin, um, and a lot of cognitive psychology. I've published on metaphor, I've published on symbol, um, I'm doing work on on the imaginal, um, talk with Chama Chi, Chitham, for example. So that's what I propose we do. I propose to unpack mythos by going through metaphor, symbol, and imaginal. And then if we get a full understanding of both the what it's like to experience these things and how they're functioning, I think that'll give us the tools for understanding myth because I think we suffer from a mythia, a, a lack mm -hmm. of uh, a myth in an important way, although we're clearly hungry for it. The, the massive success of Lord of the Rings and the Marvel movies points to a, you know, a terrific famine uh, of myth in people's lives. Um, 
So that's the proposal. How does that strike you, Robert? As, as, as uh, wonderful. Forward? Yes. Um, yes. All right. So let's start with a, a metaphor. And a metaphor is, I mean, you know, metaphor is a really hard topic. It's one of these things that is so familiar to us and so pervasive in our language and our thinking. We don't even realize mm -hmm. that most of the day we're talking about metaphor. About means around, by the way. And so it's in a metaphor. Yeah. Uh, and we're talking about it, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we're having a, we're sometimes having a hard time uh, understanding what yes. metaphor means. And the word metaphor is itself a metaphor. It means to carry over from one mm. place to the other. So metaphor is so close to us that we are sort of blind to it. Um, and one of the proposals that has been made for what was going on in the Upper Paleolithic transition, where you see that great explosion of art and technology. Mm -hmm. um, is that we gained a capacity for metaphorical thought uh, precisely because you see the production of art, hence the mm -hmm. connection to the Joseph Campbell quote. So art requires a, a, a metaphorical thought in a profound way, and metaphorical thought opens you up to a, 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 a and not, it's not just more cognition, it's a new way of thinking. This right. is why it takes children quite a while before they can do metaphor. They can't do metaphor until they're about four or five. It take, it's about the same time they get humor, and that's also relevant. Um, yeah. Right. So think about what we're doing in a metaphor. Um, like if I say love is a journey, and, and, and people say, oh, that's so hackneyed. You use it all the time. You'll say things like, you know, I think my relationship's going off course. Right. Or, you know, right. it, you know, it's been going on for a long time, going on for a yes. long time. Yeah. Or, you know, the relationship's on the rocks. Right. And yeah. so, you know, or this sort of thing. Uh, and, 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 and we take it like, but what are we doing? What are we doing when we do something like that? Well, the basic idea is we have a concept of love. And we, we have a sort of a bunch of features, what it's a relationship, it's intimate, right? And certain things are salient, stand out for us in our, in our normal version of the concept. Mm -hmm. And now well, what we do is we get this other thing that's far enough away, and I'll talk about that in a minute. It has to be the optimal gripping distance. It's mm -hmm. far enough away. So I can, what I can use is I can look through it. I can use it as a lens. So here's love. And then my other hand over here, here's journey. And what I do is I look through the things that are salient in my concept of journey. And it's like, I'm looking through rose tinted glasses. Mm -hmm. It highlights, it makes certain things salient in love that are not normally salient to me. Mm -hmm. So when I say love is a journey, what am I now making salient? Well, that I don't know, I, I'm, I'm heading in a, right? I'm heading, notice more metaphors. I'm heading in yeah. a direction. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how it's gonna unfold. I have a destination, but you know, I, I'm not sure where I'm gonna, right? And there's obstacles along the way, notice the word yes. way. Notice how the word way also means method and journey, like all, right. and you see, and so you, you get this whole, reframing of love. Now that's exactly what happens in an insight, right? In an insight, you're looking at something one way, right? And, you know, and, and then you realize, you know, so there's a man, he marries, he lives in the United States. He marries a hundred or more women a year. He divorces none of them, none of them die and he doesn't commit any crime. What's going on? He's a priest. <laughs> <laughs> Aha! Right. So notice the what happened. Problem. Oh, yeah. Now you notice what's what, there's right. There's two meanings of marry. One is yes. to become a spouse, and the other and, and the other is to make somebody into spouses. Notice what happens. The, the more common, salient one is to become a spouse. Yeah. And you have to have yeah. the insight where you realize we have to change the salience and go. No, no. The le the I have to make the, the the less common meaning more salient. Right. And that's how you get the insight. Notice you laughed. Too, by the way, yeah. notice the connection connected between humor. insight. Yeah. yeah, insight and humor are connected. And notice huh. that jokes often depend on metaphor uh, uh, in, in, in an important way too. So notice the connections between insight, metaphor, humor, cognitive flexibility, reframing. Metaphor is a way of speaking that triggers the shift between the left and the right hem left and right hemispheres that is predictive of insight. So. Getting metaphorical, getting, so think about this. When I get, remember we talked about sort of like, you know, not just an insight, but like a whole system of insights, yes. right? 
when I get metaphorical thought, it's not just that I'm not going to just have an insight here or here. I open up the possibility that wherever I can speak, I could trigger an insight. Right. Do you, do the, you understand the, how powerful the, that is? The cascading insight? Is that what this is? It, it's, it's not so much like the flow, although metaphors oh. can get you into a flow state. That's poetry. Okay. It's more, it's not a, it's not a cascade through time. Mm-hmm. It, it's more, I'm talking about the domains in which you can f- generate insight are now unlimited. They're basically any domain you can speak about. So if you can mm. talk about it, you can speak metaphor, and if you can get metaphor going, you can trigger insight. So this mm. is like an explosion in cognition. Right, right, okay. And notice right. that was a metaphor, by the way. Yeah, explosion. You can't, yeah. What, that was one of my big takeaways in your series was we speak in metaphor constantly. It's unavoidable, right? Yes. It's, and so, Okay, here's what I'm thinking about this. And tell me if this maps correctly. So we know that procedural knowledge precedes yep. semantic. So we have yes. been acting yep. a, a lot longer than we have been talking and thinking. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Well, let's say thinking through literacy about acting, right? So we, we, yes. we yep. did these patterns of action for a long time. Then we started to talk about them. So does that mean that, and it sounds like when we use metaphor, we're almost mapping these cognitive concepts back to spatio-temporal reality in a way yeah you know you talk about understand or substance or supervision like these all have to do with action of some kind that we can viscerally directly relate to yes And, and so does that mean and this is a metaphor too like does that mean then it gives it a deeper meaning when we're talking about like the journey of love um because it's closer to procedural knowledge rather than that's that's very good robert so that's a that's a theory developed by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. Lakoff's a linguist, Johnson's a philosopher. Uh, the, the classic book was Metaphors We Live By. Now, mm. I <laughs> I have to be very careful here. I've, I've published like three papers criticizing their theory, uh, uh, but I want to be careful what I what people understand what I'm criticizing. I'm not criticizing the two points you just made, the idea that cognitive metaphors are pervasive. So we're not just speaking them, we're thinking them. We're yes. thinking by right. means of them. That's what I was trying to point to. Right. I think that thesis in their theory is correct. The second thesis is that we are often mapping between propositional and, like you just said, procedural knowing. Mm-hmm. That's they have a different version where they, um, they 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 think that sensory motor behavior is sort of it's bottom up. Everything comes up out of sensory motor behavior. The fact that we're mapping between them, I agree with. The idea that it's just a one direction map right. and it's just between um, propositional and procedural, I also am critical of. Yeah. Because yeah. I think what's often happening in a metaphor is it's not only bottom up from the procedural to the propositional, it's yeah. also conceptual down. Let me try and give you an example of the kind right. of argument I've made, right? Notice how I'm going to give you three metaphor, three metaphorical meanings that all that all point to the same thing: understanding, mm-hmm. grasping. I'll do four: getting, like do you get it, mm-hmm. and seeing. Do you see my point? You see my mm-hmm. point. You get what I'm saying. Do you understand? Do you grasp it? Mm-hmm. Now, notice those all mean the same thing for you. You can use them interchangeably. But notice that the sensory motor behavior is very different. There's grasping. Yeah. There's seeing. Yeah. There's getting. And there's understanding. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Right. So here, here's my point. There has to be something other than those four that's abstract that explains how they all come to be converged together and mean the same thing. Does that right. make sense? Right. Yes. Yeah, something common among them. Right. Right. That, yes. that, that, right. So it's both. It's both. There's kind of, if you'll allow me a metaphor, it's like there's a space, a space. In, the, in our our propositional conceptual knowing, and it's bounded, but it's an abstract space. And then that space, right, puts selective pressure on which, right, and what we're doing is abstracting from different I mean, sensory motor patterns yes, okay. in order to get what fills in the gap. It's so my theory is different than their theory. Um, it's funny although, that. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to interject one thing here. This is emergence bottom up and emanation yeah. top down. You got it. Right. You got and it. Exactly. It's funny you said select because that is that mirrors Darwinian process where we have variations bottom up and selection. Or you top might down. 
you might have heard of this theory of relevance realization where there is variation being generated and then yes. there's selective pressure putting on it so that we can evolve a new way of you know comprehending something so so cognition is darwinian the very process of cognition yeah, yeah that's what i've argued before with you that wow. Uh, yeah. that relevance realization is embodying enacting the very same principles of evolution so that we can properly be said to have a participatory understanding of evolution it's not just something we think it's something we it, it's something we exemplify yes. in our very act of trying to understand that's incredible that's um it, it starts to call to mind like game theory all the way down again right we because in that it's, sense, it's, everything that to to speak in economics language, it makes everything a market almost. Even your cognition is its own little marketplace. And that's that's why I use I use the the I use the adjective, and I think you use it properly. Uh, that at the that relevance realization is a bioeconomic process. Yes. Wow. Okay, so that's what a metaphor does. That's a metaphor, right? And notice how you you made the correct move. You've said, look, it's not just a propositional thing. And so a metaphor can, of course, therefore help trigger procedural abilities. Now mm -hmm. let's take it another step forward. And let's talk about a symbol. And I'm gonna use symbol. Sometimes we use the symbol just as how one thing stands for another. I wanna use it the way Campbell was using it, right? The way Jung is using it, mm -hmm. right? The way it's used in religious studies and theology, uh, things like that. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, with something that's a symbol, but you can hear the metaphor in it, right? Uh, but I, I want you to notice that it's more visual. We symbolize justice as a blinded woman holding scale. Mm -hmm. Now, why do we do that? Think about that, right? Well, first of all, I want you to notice two. What I will argue is at least two important functions going on there. It's obviously a metaphor because we're mapping. We're mapping a blinded woman and scales onto justice. Right. So there's a metaphor, but there's something else going on there, right? So I'm gonna, I, I wanna point out what I, I would argue at least two features that take it above and beyond just a metaphor. We're doing this because I'm gonna ask you to do something here. And, and I, without just repeating the word to yourself again and again and again, I want you to hold justice in mind. Try. <laughs> right okay. now yeah, and now yeah, robert i yeah, want to ask yeah. you another question and i know what the answer is going to be because i come to know your character i think to some degree do you care about justice is it important to you of course yes okay so you care about it a lot and yeah. yet you can't hold it in mind it's very hard to care and relate to something when you can't hold it in mind this, because it's an eternal principle of some kind that you can't well there's that so this is give you uh -huh. Plato would be very proud of you, Robert. That was fantastic, right? It, there, there's there there it, its scope and application and its ontological status and also its complexity, yeah. right? It, it like, it's like this, right? Yeah. So now think what you're doing. You're trying to manage all these different variables that are interacting in many different domains. So what what part of your brain would be a really big help to try and activate and get it engaged in that? Your cerebellum. Uh, your cerebellum. What does your cerebellum do? It evolved. Do you know that cerebellum has, has actually expanded over evolutionary history faster and greater than the frontal lobes? Because, and we'll talk about that. The cerebellum is designed, what the cerebellum does is, you know, that we, we used to say it was for balance, but now we know what it does. You're using the, cere the cerebellum also when you're balancing an equation. The cerebellum's job is to take find complex patterns of contingency and relationship between variables in many domains within the brain mm -hmm. and coordinate them together and get rid of the noise and, and make them more efficient. Right. Huh. It's the cerebellum, right? So if I get you to imagine balance, you're triggering the cerebellum as yeah. you try and think about justice. So you're right. using right. your procedural and perspectival knowing to try and give you the needed cognitive neurological machinery to to grasp it. Sense. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. Now notice that there's wow. a perspectival element in blinding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? Well, because when I'm like this, 
I'm not biased in where I'm looking. Yes. You can bring that. Up. And so you're trying to get a perspective. You're trying to get what it's like to not bias your percep- your perception. You're trying to get that machinery also activated. Yes. Right. Yes. So you can bring that to bear. And then you're trying to co- you're trying to bring the two together and they're integrated in the image, the symbol. So now you've created this very complex metaphor that allows you to hold something in mind that you couldn't otherwise hold in mind. Yeah. It gives you an image. And you're doing, remember, I think we talked about exaptation. Your brain takes a, 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 an area that's evolved for one purpose right. and, and you and reuses it, repurposes it. Yes. So the cerebellum has been repurposed and you're repurposing the, you know, your, your perspectival knowing of, you know, your, of your perceptual engagement with the world, you're exacting that. And you're saying, don't use it for physical balance. Don't use it for physical perception. Mm-hmm. I want to use these areas right now to help me see, <laughs> notice mm-hmm. the metaphor, mm-hmm. to see mm-hmm. justice and be able to hold it in mind and relate to it so right. that if I need to, I can reflect upon it and talk about it and share it with others. That's a symbol. So, that's amazing. Uh, the, uh, object-oriented programming comes to mind where it's like, to deal with this concept, we need an icon for it in a way. Yeah, and it, it, I guess it, we're map, way, yeah. ma- mapping that back to something we can viscerally relate to, like a blind yeah. woman holding scales. Well, yeah. So the point is, you notice how the mapping is not just between the procedural and the the, uh, the propositional, but the yeah. propositional, the procedural, the perspectival. Even right. participatory, because it's you don't just know about balance; you enact it. Yes, like your very your very sense of yourself and yes. knowledge of yourself. So notice that how how you, I'm making justice present to you in a way that permeates deeply into the right. layers of your cognition and activates them and potentially exacts them to help you see and yes. relate to justice that's a symbol to see and it's it's interesting because even when you say see it's almost like we are seeing this symbol but we're also relating to the fact that she's not seeing the bias of sight yeah, is yeah, eliminated yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's more based on this proprioception of the honest weight and measure right that she's holding yes, yes that weighs yes. and balances all things without bias and, and notice notice what that does notice what you're doing now. No, you're seriously playing with this, the symbol. Yeah. And, yes, and yes, what yes, you just yes. did was exactly right. So look, right. And, and, and serious play, we, you know, that's ritual, right? right? So notice how you almost start doing ritual because you said what it's making me do is shift from the privilege I usually give to vision yes. to proprioception. And notice that when we want to talk about something being real, we say being in touch with it. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. And the grasping is to touch it. It's the yes. appropriate. Right. And we know that vision, while powerful, also keeps us actually at a distance mm-hmm. from things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to the in this symbol, the technological element, because I can't think without the scale, right, without our relationship to this tool yeah. that's not biological, clearly, we couldn't have a symbol for this um, non-biased device for weighing things that I can think of at least. I mean, and and notice the metaphor goes the other way. We, we talk for, for example, in predictive processing, you know, you talk about how, um, or our connection is a neural networks, how much you're weighting the signal or how Mm -hmm. much you're weighting. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Uh, And so, but to your your point earlier about this feedback where it goes both ways, it's like we needed to, have this second order thinking to create things like scales, but then the scale itself becomes incorporated into another symbol of justice that then feeds back into our under, or our conception of justice. The, uh, if you mean by second order thinking, the kind that or- originates in the axial revolution, the scale is justice goes way back. It's pre-axial. Mm. See it deep millennia, millennial, millennia before the axial revolution, you see it within Egyptian art, mm. mythology. I guess I'm thinking maybe second order thinking is not the right term. Just the chasm we crossed, I guess, to go from pre-written history to where we're actually producing art and then producing tools. 
yeah. that tool when this gets it i started reading that book um oh my goodness the um oh the extension of mind the theory you told me about uh the name is escaping me at the moment where the uh, tools we make in turn shape us the, the, the oh uh, uh how, how things shape the mind is yes that, is, how things shape yeah, the yeah. mind and it's material how engagement about, theory is what i'm thinking of engagement theory. yeah we talked about that yes yeah so yeah. i was just thinking how like the the actual act of creating this tool we become familiar with the unbiased honest exactly. way and measure of the tool yeah. but then the tool itself feeds back into our metaphorical conception of something deeper like justice yes yeah, exactly exactly and when and that's exactly right and so notice how and this was part of my criticism on Lakoff and Johnson, right? Instead of this sort of one direction, it's this very complex yeah. self-organizing yeah. system and it's doing exaptation and it's yes. doing all this circulation that you just talked about. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So symbols sit within, you know, this, you know, this dynamical system of extended mind that has a life of its own as a mm -hmm. life of its own right so so that's a symbol and you can see how you start to what you did is you start to seriously play with it yeah right. the two, that's yeah i guess and one of the takeaways from that book is that the I, you hear the word mind you often think just what's inside your yeah. skull but the argument in that book is that our mind is all around us everything we're that's creating exactly is an extension right. yes. of mind and then you can you know we make the scale to measure things but then we sort of exact the physical scale back into abstract space Yep. Uh, and, and as we've yeah. talked about before, we do that not only with material tools, we do it with psychotechnology, yes. like literacy and numeracy. And right. then the hybrid things like what you've been talking about, like money, right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Exactly. So that's a symbol. Yeah. Right. And and, and notice how, right, it, it has a, a, like almost a life of its own. And you want to seriously play with it. Ritual and symbol are bound up together. Yes. Okay, so now let's do the imaginal, right? The imaginal. Okay, so the distinction is between, and, and, and the thing you just made about extended mind, which is one of the four E's of four E cognitive science, right. by the way, yeah. right? Yeah. right? Uh, that's, that's gonna be really relevant to talking about the imaginal. So this is a distinction that Corbin makes, and he's using it to try and understand the Neoplatonic tradition, especially within Sufism, within Islam. Um, and, uh, Great credit to him for doing that. Um, I think it would, it would really help us if we could uh, understand uh, the spiritual tradition within Islam uh, uh, in, in a way, I think, much more careful and reflective than the media presents it. Mm -hmm. Both sides, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. So Corbin made a distinction between the imaginary, which is basically your ability to create an image in your mind. Like I, ask, I can ask you, can you imagine a sailboat? Can you mm -hmm. picture a sailboat? Interestingly, about 5% of the population can't do this. Uh, but hmm. um, <laughs> now that's the imaginary. And the problem is we have one word, one verb, imagine, and one noun, imagination, and it covers these two very different things. Mm -hmm. That's the imaginary. What's the imaginal? The imaginal is when the child gets a stick, ties a blanket around them, and says, I'm Zorro. They're not picturing anything in their head. Mm. What are they doing? What are they doing? The, so the image isn't, if you'll allow me the spatial metaphor, the image isn't in here. It's between here and the world. They're doing the material mm. engagement thing. They're picking up material items, mm -hmm. right? But they're not reshaping them physically. They're reshaping them by reframing them mm. metaphorically. But see, right? I, they're seeing the they're seeing the stick through a sword lens right and they're seeing cape, the blanket through a cape lens yeah. right but it's a symbol for them because what they're doing is they're trying to enact what's it like to be zora what's the perspectival knowing yeah. can i develop some of the skills what does it feel like in my body and yeah. what would my identity be like what would myself be like i'm i'm trying on an identity i'm trying on a role yeah. and now the yeah. serious play is being enacted in extended mind and material engagement that's the imaginal so they're trying was, on the the they're experiment, experimenting with the agent and arena exactly yeah, yeah. exactly is exactly. this trying on a worldview then because it isn't the worldview yes. the, the attunement be, least, between the two yeah you're trying on an implicit worldview so now let's but let's get there now let's say i have 
now let's say I can do the following, which human beings can do, mm. right? I can do this imaginal projection, and I'm not using projection here in a negative sense. Mm-hmm. I can do this Im- imaginal projection, which is doing this, affording that feedback loop you were talking about a few minutes ago, mm-hmm. right? I can do that imaginal projection. And one of the things I can do is I can augment my reality detection through that imaginal projection. So let me give you a, a metaphor for this, <laughs> right? An, an analogy. Um, you know what a heads-up display is for a fighter pilot, right? Of course. So a heads-up display, you, you, so they, there's things being projected onto the windshield of the yeah. cockpit yeah. so that they don't have to look at their instruments. They can still look through the cockpit, but also see, right? So they, they're getting an augmented ability to perceive their environment because there is an image being projected on the, wi- the window screen. Is right. that, is that, is, is yes, the with relevant yeah. performance data. Yep, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So now instead of, instead of doing that right physically what human beings can do is they can do imaginal augmentation of reality so they can imagine they can and that's what the kids doing they're yep. what they're doing is they're doing this imaginal thing and that play is developmental because they're trying to pick up on you know so sensor motor patterns states of consciousness yes and potential identities, and they're trying them on and seeing what the world discloses from that viewpoint. Is that okay? Yes, yes. Okay. I would properly argue that a lot of religious ritual is imaginally augmented reality realization and relevance realization. That's exactly what you're doing. You go into a church and you're, and I don't mean this pejoratively, I mean it the way the kid, right? You're engaging in a serious play of imaginal right work mm-hmm. with symbols in order to get in order to train yourself to new way new states of mind new you know new new states of identity mm-hmm. new sensory motor skills patterns of interaction patterns of reflection patterns of being with each other in relation mm-hmm. to being with yourself mm-hmm. you're doing all of this and you're doing this like it's like a massive heads up display Mm -hmm. Uh, for trying to see right what the good life is and how you could possibly live it right in okay so what one of the purposes of play is we're actually testing and discovering yeah exactly boundaries again this is kind of metaphorical because it's not just physical boundaries it's also you know roles like you know if you're playing i'm we used to play Ninja Turtles. I'm Leonardo. Okay. You're Raphael. You're Michelangelo. Okay. Like everyone had their yeah. own role, their own certain weapon, yeah, et cetera. Exactly. Exactly. And then exactly. Piaget, I think, goes into and maybe it wasn't Piaget, someone else, but they discovered that morality emerges from play. So there's so, a lot around that, and, and, so and these, metacognition does too. Yeah. Bogos- so, playing with others. Yep. Go ahead. So the this process is how we're actually figuring out um it seems like from this process if i'm saying that boundaries roles and morality emerge from this kind of play process through the imaginal is this how we're then constructing those canopies that we talked about that we we ultimately organize ourselves under yes think about this what what brings together your skills your states of mind and your identity virtue Mm. hey everybody As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. 
Hmm. And virtue is the beauty of wisdom. Virtue is how you specifically practice being wise and fitting your wisdom to specific situations. And so I don't mean this in a, just a sort of weak, you know, mm -hmm. uh, small L liberal, you know, you know post enlightenment idea. Religion is the imaginally augmented serious play with symbols that allows us to cultivate virtue. Of course, right. where I'm talking about the ideal case when everything is running well. Religions yes. like everything else can be gamed, can be manipulated, can be yes. malevolent. Yes. But when it works and it sticks around for a long time because it works, yes. that's what it, I would argue it's doing. And I'm not meaning something trivial. I'm meaning something really profound. Yes. Yeah, it, very interesting. And then we, not this isn't we're almost, just. We're almost to myth, by the way. We're almost to myth. Almost to myth. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to in, insert here that um, this is indeed, I'm calling to mind Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens. This is what enables human beings to be the dominant species in the world. Very much. That we can very organize much. ourselves flexibly in large numbers beneath these symbolic canopies that emerge yeah. from, I guess, metaphor, symbol, and imaginal play. Very much. A book I highly recommend to you is Mark, Matt Rossano, and I got to meet Matt. And he really liked my stuff on religio and relevance realization because okay. we, we, we saw each other talk, yeah. right? His book, Supernatural Selection, and he okay. has a line in there. I think it's in there. It might be in one of his papers. I'm pretty sure it's in the book, though, where he says, the reason why we beat the Neanderthals is because the Neanderthals were atheists, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah okay. Right. Uh, yeah. He means it very tongue in cheek. So no, I don't want to get a, a thousand comments about uh, slamming atheism. What he meant was our capacity for religio, our capacity yes. for doing everything I've described yes. here is yes. and, you know, all of this. Think about how functional and powerful and transformative all of this machinery is. Now, when you tell stories and here's one other thing, narrative, what does narrative do for you? Kids also don't come naturally narrative. We have to yeah. practice narrative with them. Daniel, right. over and over. And we, yes. I had two kids. I had to sit time. through the Teletubbies. Yeah. I had to sit yeah. through the Teletubbies twice. <laughs> it's like insane. I just, ah, we, we dumb it down and we gradually. And that's yeah. why they can't do jokes because jokes depend on insight and narrative being yes. integrated. And it's like, ah, right. But we I don't notice how we think narrative is. It's now like second nature to us. Yes. What does narrative yes. do? Well, one of the functions, and this goes to work with Keith Oatley, a, a colleague of mine at UFT, and a bunch of other people, Daniel Hudo, um, uh, and uh, situated interaction theory, and a whole bunch of stuff, right? The idea is that narrative turns you into a temporally extended agent. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So that's what I'm going to talk about two important functions. Because in narrative, I do this weird, weird, weird thing, which is I, I, I establish an identity mm. that's not logical or categorical. If I compare John now to John who was born in Hamilton and Joseph Brandt, those two beings, they're, they're different weight, different sizes, different that I can speak, that John can't. Like the differences are overwhelming. And yet somehow you can show me a picture and I'll go, there I am, and that's where I was born. And that is yes. non so non logical, non categorical. Categorical yeah. means like when I put two things together and say these are both fingers. Yes. It's not that kind of identity either. So you have what's called personal identity. Personal identity is constructed and dependent on narrative. It makes you a temporally extended self, and therefore it also allows you to aspire in transformation because mm. you don't have to stay the same. Think about what I'm going to say here right now. You don't have to stay the same in order to be the same person. In fact, you expect the opposite. Yes. Okay, so yeah. that's narrative. That's, that's one function. Here's another function of narrative, narrative telling stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how am I going to get into your head? Well, I can try and get what you believe from your speech and mm -hmm. what you desire from your action, belief and desire. Mm -hmm. but the problem is that's too weak. That's too weak. So, I see you, right, at a party, and you close your eyes rapidly. Is it a blink or a wink? Well, it depends. Depends on the setting. Is, is, your, is your partner right near you, and there's mm. a moment where you, or, right, has somebody, right, has some dust just scattered, or, right, are you trying to 
communicate with somebody other than the person you directly communicate. Like I have to know the setting. I also have mm -hmm. to know what kind of person you are, right? Are you a person that is generally, you know, likes that kind of social play mm -hmm. or are you a person who doesn't like, I need to know your character. Mm -hmm. I need to know, right. I need to know, I need to know the plot. What was happening just before and what's likely going to happen afterwards. Notice what I need to do in order to get mind sight, in order to see into your mind. I need to, I, I wrap it in narrative. This is the narrative right. practice. I yeah. so notice what narrative does. It makes me a temporally extended self, which is so important to who we are. Yeah. Think about the kind of life you can lead that a dog can never lead. Right. Bertrand Russell once said, you know, no matter how eloquently a dog barks, it can't tell you that its parents were poor, but hardworking. Right. Right. So you have this, right, yeah, right? That's hilarious. <laughs> so narrative makes you a temporally extended self and it allows you to see into other minds. That yes. also helps you cultivate what? Virtue. Right. If I'm a moral agent, I need to be able to see well into other minds and be a temporally extended agent. Yes. Right. Now I have, I've got, I've got metaphor, symbol, the imaginal, and then I've got this idea of imaginally augmented reality uh, enhancement, right? Right. Serious play, ritual. I put that all into narratives. I put I put the symbols and I put the association with rituals mm -hmm. and I do it imaginally, right? Because myths don't take place now or that they take place once upon a time, right? They're yeah. imaginal. Yes, right. They're in the realm of serious play. And so what is it? What is that I'm doing with all of that? I'm cult, I'm affording my ability to cultivate virtue and to see deep patterns in reality, both social and ecological reality. So perennial patterns, perennial problems, and also pertinent problems and patterns that are yes. shared, right? And that's what myth gives me. It's this tremendous ability to cultivate virtue coordinated with seeing a kind of ontological depth perception that I wouldn't otherwise have. Myths are not stories about long ago events that are turned out to be false. They are ways of seeing deep patterns, either perennial or pertinent, right. that I need to cultivate virtue in, right? I need to cultivate virtue in order to properly respond to those patterns. The myth helps me pick up on the patterns and it helps me to try and cultivate the virtue for those perennial and pertinent patterns. Incredible. So mythos is a time tested meta narrative, perhaps? It's a it's a meta narrative, but it's it's almost like it, it's I, I think of it as a very powerful psychotechnology that is coordinating the psychotechnology of narrative, yes. of, of the imaginal, of the symbolic, and ultimately of that basic ability for metaphor yes. that it, it is indispensable to us. Yes. Can't, notice that I don't just have spoken metaphor. Notice what my hands are doing. My hands are doing an active metaphor. Right, right, right. Yes. Yeah, both rooted in the procedural knowing, yep. right? Even when yep. you're talk, exactly. talking with our hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it makes so. So then the I'm kind of uh, visualizing here the narratives almost as a totalizing simulation. So we're pulling together all these different cognitive capabilities we have. We're yeah, putting it yeah. in this container called a narrative and running the simulation. That's Keith Oatley's idea. It's a totalizing simulation. And he compares, uh, he compares like fiction mm -hmm. um, to like seeing a Shakespearean play where you're right. doing, and drama is the original. And we know that shamans dramatize. Yes. Right? It's the original simulation. And why is the shaman Dram why, why is it so I'm in dramatizing the antelope? I, I mm -hmm. saw a video of a uh, Sung Bushman, right? Um, it's, I'm sorry, I think that's not that's not respectful. I think I should just call him Sung, I, okay. I, right? Not, rather than the colonial uh, uh, naming, which okay. is not respectful to them. So, but I watched a video of them hunting an antelope, and, and, and they do persistence hunting. You know, where you chase and chase and chase until the animal heat strokes. Yeah. And and so they're following and then they get up to get to a place where they lose the antelope. And I'm watching the video of this. So it's just engrossing and gripping, right? Yeah. And they and they and they they, they choose the runner. He's going to go on ahead and then he's run 
And what he, he's the whole way along, he's gesturing, he's doing a gesture for antelope. And then he stops and he just, he's lost the track and he doesn't give up. You know, he get he, he gets into, he enacts the antelope. He embodies oh, the antelope. Yeah. And then yeah. he get and he go, ah, the antelope would go that way. And he ah, goes and finds the antelope. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. That's yeah. mythos in action. The wow. narrative, the symbolism, the metaphorical, yes. the embodiment, the serious play, the enactment. And then if you told a story about that, right, in words, yes, it would it would it would feel like a, you're telling a myth. Yes. Right, right, right. Okay. So narratives are these like totalizing simulations of all these tools we've laid out. Um, mythos. Yes. yes. Mythos. Sorry. Yeah. And then we're talking specifically about like metaphor, symbols, the imaginal, imaginal narrative, putting it all, all into one, display. all its own one universe, space. basically. Yeah. And then you're running a simulation. Yeah. Um, and then would then mythos be, you know, that's each of us individually. Every time we, you know, put our kids to bed, we're doing story time, they're running a little simulation. And then over time, yeah. we're synthesizing all of these narratives, That's exactly interaction, right. and then the invariants among them, or the common patterns among them emerge, yes. they're abstracted yes. into these meta narratives Brilliant. of mythos. Brilliant. Brilliant. So uh, I, it might have been young, and I hesitate, it might have been young, but young, uh, anyways, this, this is this, I am quoting somebody. Yeah. Um, that a dream is a private myth and a myth is a public dream. Ah, uh -huh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And so now given, and that even makes more sense about uh, sort of the current theory of dreaming that what we're doing in dreaming is we're doing this kind of serious imaginal yes. play. And, and what we're trying to do is, is improve our, we're basically tr and the, the Hintons at the core of deep learning is this algorithm called the wake sleep algorithm. Or, and he actually called it the wake sleep algorithm. And there's a phase where the neural network fantasizes it's dreaming because what the neural yes. network does is it goes from trying to recognize the world to generating variants and they're generating the simulations. So it can pick up on stuff that it missed in its previous act yes. of recognition and it evolves this way. And then what you do is stack a bunch of those on top of each other with deep learning. Yes. So yes, very much what you get is you got individuals are doing this obviously at their own level. And then they're sharing it. And then you get the, the, the generalized other, the compression, the, yes. what's invariant between ex, within extended cognition. And then also, Robert, you start to get what's invariant in extended context, not just here now in the city of Sparta, but also in the mm. city of Athens. With, right. right. And how do we get a, a myth that can apply to both, yes. et cetera? And this so gets. That's mythos. That's mythos. This is amazing. So just in to reroute this in like pragmatic reality. Yeah. Um, one of the things first, like religio, I think, or religio, I'm not sure you pronounce that. I think Neither am I. <laughs> Joseph Campbell said that means to link back actually. So what you're describing here is that's, this that's, process. That's of, yeah. And religio means to bind together and religare and religio mm -hmm. are the two con candidates for the etymological origin of religion. Ah, religion. to bind together, which is almost like the logos, yeah. right? You said that. Yes, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes, and then, exactly. And then just to root this in some, like, again, this is not just story making. This is very practical how we advance ourselves over time. I think it was also Jung that said science, I'm sorry, alchemy was the dream from which science was born. So we had this fantasy about, yeah. you know, being able to, experiment in nature and derive some utility or value from it, which was a heretical concept at the time. So it was just a dream, yep. but we started to enact the dream yes. and that those enactments became kind of the proto scientific method that led us into the scientific revolution. Ultimately. It's, yeah. That's one important dimension of alchemy. Yeah. What you, to really strengthen your argument, is to go into, and I, I recommend uh, Raff's work, R-A-F-F, -F, the, uh, the Alchemical Imagination, mm. right? You know, that alchemy is, is very much, you have to understand it very much as a spiritual religious practice in which people are attempting to put themselves through uh, serious play, imaginally augmented yeah. reality yeah. detection, so that they can cultivate profound virtue and wisdom. So right. alchemy, while it has this exploration of the world, it also has all of this stuff, all the religion we've been yeah. talking about. 
Yeah. And it's interesting that as science separates off from alchemy, what we have is the scientific worldview in the Enlightenment tries to fill that hole. It tries mm -hmm. to say, how can we afford people these connectedness, these kinds of projects? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that's that's what you see. That's the epitome of what Spinoza is doing. Spinoza is taking the emergent scientific worldview, the mathematical Cartesian worldview, mm -hmm. and he's trying to figure out, yeah, but how can I get the aspiration to virtue uh, and wisdom back into the scientific worldview? Interesting. Yeah, that's just can so. Can I say one more thing, Robert? Please, so please. Something that was really quick, but it's really important. You you shot you you pointed to the interdependence between mythos and logos, right? Logos and uh, mythos yeah. need each other profoundly. Yes, and that's something that Plato makes very clear. For example, in the Plato is so critical of mythos, and yet he regularly engages in it. And even the the whole book of the Republic is an imaginal. Uh, it's, it's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. The Republic is the serious play in imaginal space so that we can understand justice better. Right. And there's a deep, you see this deep relationship between mythos and logos running this dialectical tension running through Plato. Yes. Uh, so it occurs to me here, maybe the, the delineation between work and play, they seem to be kind of interdependent as well, where play yes. is where we're freely experimenting with these different boundaries and situations. Yes. And then once you've discovered something useful, you kind of work to regiment it, right? Yeah, or work okay. to create it. So, but even like, if you have a great job, like I'm sure you do, I yeah. feel like some of my work is play, right? I'm experimenting freely, but then I have to actually work to regiment and prepare for some of these shows. So there's a, there's a connection there. There is, and so, and it's to a really some really good uh, cognitive science and psychology, the work of Michael Apter. Mm. Um, and so, what we have to be careful about is we can equivocate on uh, the word work. We can mm. mean we can mean it motivationally and how we're disposing our metabolic uh, energy, or right. we can mean things that people pay us for, right? Right. right and yeah. those aren't necessarily the same thing. Yes. So I'm I'm gonna put I'm gonna put away the the meaning of work, which means something that I do that people pay me for. Yes, I want to now talk about the, the, the contrast between play and work, the way it's understood in Michael Apter's theory called reversal yeah. theory. And it's totally relevant to everything we're talking about here. Yeah. So you can think about two ways in which you experience your, I'm going to use the word arousal, but I want people to understand that doesn't mean sexual arousal per se. Right. It doesn't exclude it, but it, but it just means like piquing your interest. You're, Something. Well, and also the degree of just metabolic expenditure. Mm, okay. Right? Like how, 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 how much energy, metabolic energy are you expending? All right. right. Now let's think of, right. If you are oriented, he calls it telically. What does that mean? That I'm doing some behavior for some end state. And that end state is what I value. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The more metabolic energy I'm expending, the more I have not got to the thing that's inherently valuable. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I, I'm going to experience that if this keeps going, I'm going to start to experience this as frustrating, potentially mm -hmm. futile, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right. So high levels of energy expenditure means I haven't got to the valuable state that I want to be in. Right. Okay. When I can, when I can, when I get to the valuable state, what can I do? I can shut off all of that expenditure and I can relax and enjoy the state. Right. That's work. That's work. Right. That's the yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, compare that and notice how you reverse things. Compare an activity you're doing for its own sake. Let's say you love tennis. You're playing tennis. Now there's a goal in tennis and there are rules, but we, we the the point isn't to get to the end, right? You don't say, "You know what? Let's just do one shot and if I win, I win the game of tennis." <laughs> right well right or, or or listening to music there's an end to the music but yeah. you don't want to say just play the last note i just want to get yeah. to the last note, right, right? right. Or, yeah or, or when you're making love to somebody right yeah you don't yeah, to yeah. <laughs> notice there high metabolic expenditure means more involvement with the inherently valuable activity oh uh, yeah, yeah so notice I can be in a, see, here's just your metabolic level of expenditure, right? At yeah. this level. But if I'm in the telic mode, that is something very good for me. Yeah. But if I'm in the paratelic mode, that's something very, very positive for me. And you probably have already realized that flow is a paratelic state, right? Yeah. Is this finite and infinite games too? It like, can be. 
It okay. can be. It very much can be. But the first that I mentioned, yeah, work where the activity is for the goal. Yes. When the goal is for the activity, that's play. Ah, okay. So the kid is being Zorro, and the goal is to kill the villain. But, the, you know, the kid wants the playing to last as long as possible. In fact, there are two great gods for a young child. Play, right, and yeah. candy, right? Uh, Boys okay. and candy, play and candy. Yeah. I once asked my four-year-old son, he's now 17. Uh, this is how you do philosophy with a young child. I once, I once asked him, what's more important, your toys or candy? And he looked at me. I, it was precious. He looked at me like, finally, dad has asked me a, a, a good question. <laughs> he did something which he, which he wouldn't normally do as a four-year-old. He, he did that. Give me a moment. Yeah. I want to think. Uh, interesting. And then he came back and he said, toys, because you can get filled with candy. And I thought, oh, that's, uh, that's a good answer. And it's a good answer. And notice what he likes about play. He can extend it as long as possible. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that's play and work. And you are right. Think about all that reversal and that the imaginal and serious play and yes. all of that's yeah. bound up over here. And then that's different from work in, in the specified meaning we've given to that work. And, right. and then right. what we, we do is we can actually bounce between them, right? We can go into work and we can realize that we lack a certain developmental virtue, skill, state of mind, right? And then we yes. can take it into play and we can work that out like, like the wake sleep algorithm. We can yes. generate yes. variations and then see if they plug us back into the world. Here's work, here's religion, yes. right? And back and forth between the two. Interesting. So that's why, that's why the day of rest, for example, in Judaism mm -hmm. is sacred because you're not supposed to be in the work mode. You're right. supposed to go into the serious play mode so you can cultivate virtue and wisdom. Interesting. Is there a relationship between these two temporally? Because I'm thinking that in play, almost by definition, you're seeking or entering a flow state. Yes. Where time is just passing quickly. You're enjoying yourself. Yeah. Whereas in work, we're actually typically trying to improve our productivity, right? Or do some, create something that improves our productivity, which is us, our ability to overcome time, right? To reduce scarcity, therefore freeing us up for additional play. So, yeah. so, so there's part yeah. like experimentation of play and then systemization of work, something like that. Well, I, I, well here's what I would, I'll, I'll, I want to talk about it mythologically. Okay, perfect. Play is, so both are ways of moving out of time. Mm -hmm. Play puts us into relationship with the eternal. Work puts us into relationship with the immortal. What's the difference? I don't know the difference. What's the difference? And that's yeah. a good difference. People often confuse eternity and immortality. Yeah. Immortality is that things, so, you know, uh, Immortality would mean that you would keep existing in time. So, uh, yes, work we are producing so that human civilization is immortal. That's yes, that, yes. that's ultimately what work is, right? right. Civilized trying to make civilization immortal. Yes, eternal is to move out of time and space. Right. Right. Okay. So, right. To transcend. When you're, in the, when you're in the flow state, three hours passes and. You can't tell if a minute has passed or three hours has passed. Yeah. You're getting into a way and, and mystical experiences, which are sort of ultimate flow states, are experiences of timelessness, yeah. spacelessness, eternity. So play, if, if play doesn't mean just trivial entertainment, but seriously, like we're talking about here, it's supposed to put us into right relationship with eternity. Work is supposed to put us into right relationship with immortality. Fascinating. Wow. And the... That's incredible. So and, and then almost like bridging the gap between the two, because immortality is the closest we could ever approach eternity within the bounds of space and time. No, I, I would disagree with you there. Wow, I think okay. I would say that you you're right. Uh, immortality, keep things going through time mm -hmm. is a very different experience, although we are prone to confuse them. Then. OK, so let me let me put you in touch with eternity. Here we go. 
Does two plus two equal four? Yes. When? Eternally. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. But you don't mean everlasting. You don't mean yes. it started at one right. point. Right, right, right. And and at this a, is, this is a priori rationalistic knowledge, basically. It can be. It doesn't have to be. It can also be other things mm -hmm. that are like the fact that, you know, some of the things we were talking about er er earlier, you know, the aspects of our, our you know, uh, uh, of our existence that aren't bound by, like, like let me, uh, let me try. I'm, I'm, I'm babbling. E equals MC squared. That's not a priori. Right. But it's eternal because if I would add at least eternal, if we take the universe to be an unbounded thing. Right. Yeah. Because if I ask you, where is e equals MC squared? What, right. Right. When is it? No. Yes. So time and space don't apply to it because it's higher order than time and space. Right. And it's constraining time and space. That's the whole point. Right. Of yes. The, of yes. The, right. And so it's not just a priori. It can also be something that we discover through. Yes. Scientific endeavor. Right. I want to get, I want to drill. So, and we'll take a break after this, but the, I think what I was meaning there is not the individual experience of immortality or eternity that what you're saying completely makes sense to me. Right. I like that you're, you said that the purpose of work is to make civilization immortal. Yes. And this, this connects to the Austrian school where they say civilization itself is a reflection of our collective time preference, which once, yes. once yes. again, the lower your time preference the more you're interacting with these slices of your temporal agency across time. Yes, right? You're yes. thinking more long-term. So the more yes. we can lower time preference, the more civilized we become, the more immortal civilization becomes. Yes, and that is all, that. that's all done through work. So what I was trying to draw the connection between there is we, by lowering, we lower our time preference through work, we construct a civilization that becomes more immortal it's a closer yeah. reflection of the timelessness. It's less of, so we'd say eternity is completely unaffected by time, right? As you've said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, yes. like a photon that moves through space at the speed of light is unaffected yeah. by time, by definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The more um, productive you become or the lower the time preference your civilization is, the less affected it is by time. So it's approaching that timelessness, although it can never get there. Yeah, there's a. I, I see what you're saying. Maybe a way of phrasing this is that as we get, I'm going to try and do this carefully, and I'm not sure it's going to be right. So be charitable, please. Mm -hmm. As we get a sense of the immortality through history, which is a narrative, by the way, yep. of our civilization, we get a metaphor for eternity. Yes, yes. Maybe that's the right. Yes, immortality is kind of a metaphor for eternity. Um, and that's what Plato argues. He argues that the the immortality we see in our ability to procreate, to have children, mm, right, is right. Uh, it, it is an image of yes, eternity of the forms. Yes, that makes sense too. From a genetic standpoint, that's the most timeless aspect about us. Our genes yes. are yes. almost yes. immortal, basically. Yes. Yes. No. Very much. Yeah. Yeah.